Well, welcome to another Friday night. We're working through this series on reparenting ourselves as part of the process of healing from complex trauma. And I thought I'd just get you to think about that a little different way. Reparenting ourselves, you could say it another way, it's what's involved in parenting a child with complex trauma. That might just kind of open up a new way of looking at it for you. And so you can really take that two ways. For all of us with complex trauma, parenting a child with complex trauma is kind of then what does that mean about how we would parent ourselves. But the second thing is I, I realize that for many people who are listening to this series, they're really hearing it on two levels. You're hearing it on the level of parenting myself, but you're also thinking about your children and parenting your children and realizing that they are already dealing with some complex trauma. And so you're translating what I'm telling you into parenting your children. And so hopefully what I give you tonight is going to help you think through both of those areas, parenting yourself and parenting your children. And so I want to come at it from four different perspectives when it comes to parenting a child with complex trauma. Donna Nakazawa has written a book called Childhood Disrupted, How Your Biography Becomes Your Biology and How You Can Heal. And in that book, she is writing to parents who are parenting children who have complex trauma and she gives 14 parenting strategies. So I want to begin by borrowing from her, her 14 parenting strategies that I hope will just be very helpful and practical to you. So the first one is manage your own baggage. So somebody has said the greatest gift we can give our kids is to work on ourselves. And I say that all the time. And Dan Siegel said better parents make better kids. Research is showing that the biggest issue in determining secure, healthy attachment between a child and their parent is how well the parent is working on their own baggage. So we come back to the whole point again that if you want to parent your children, you got to work on your own stuff. That's the starting point. The second is, don't confuse unpredictable, toxic stress with healthy childhood challenges that foster resilience. So a couple weeks ago, we, t we had a talk on resilience. A and we said that children need challenges. Those challenges, like learning to ride a bike, to tie their shoe, they add stress and there's a wobble effect where the child goes, oh, 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 I don't know if I can handle this, but you're there to support them and to train them and, and as a result they learn tools and, and pretty soon they go back to an allostasis where that's no longer stressful because they know how to handle it and so that is an important part of their development but don't confuse that with complex trauma stress so what you would have in complex trauma type stress that's not healthy is a child that's being bullied by a sibling, by somebody at school, and you, it would be wrong to say, oh, just get over it. Or a child who has an alcoholic parent, or a, a parent who's a rageaholic, or a parent who's constantly critical and neg negative, or a parent who expects the child to do everything perfectly, or a, a home where the child is constantly being teased, or a parent with mental health issues like depression, or a parent who doesn't regulate their own emotions, or a parent who shows favoritism to one of the children, or a parent who's a narcissist. All of those things cause a whole lot of stress to the child, but the problem is they can't resolve it because it's dependent on the parent changing in order to resolve it, and the parent is not changing. So that is not a healthy stress that they can grow through. That is a stress they cannot resolve that sends them into fight or flight and creates complex trauma. So don't confuse healthy stresses from un 
with unhealthy stresses. The next one, instill the four S's. So that is to be seen, to be safe, to be soothed, to be secure. So a child needs to know that they're seen. And that means that you get them. You listen to them. You connect with them. And when you're with them, you're present to them. They need to be safe. They need to know that and feel that you accept them. That you are protecting them. That you are regulating your own emotions. That you're not doing anything that is abusive verbally or emotionally. They need safety. Then they need to be soothed. And that means that you're helping them solve their painful emotions. So they know how to resolve that stuff. And you're, you're helping them learn to soothe themselves, to regulate their own emotions. And so a few months back, we talked about emotional regulation. And we said that in order for emotional regulation to happen, there needs to be rhythm, connection, and then there needs to be words of encouragement, support, comfort, teaching, guidance. And so you're soothing them. You're helping them to learn to soothe themselves. Then you provide security. They need to feel secure. And so that is, they know that you are consistent and reliable. They know that you are attuned to their needs and that you're connected to them. That's what creates security. So instill the four S's. That is such important foundational stuff. Then the next one is look into their eyes regularly. Now it's interesting that what research has discovered is that looking into somebody, a child's eyes, activates their vagus nerve. And basically your vagus nerve is initiates your parasympathetic nervous system. It helps you to relax. It helps you to drop your guard to rest, to feel safe and secure. And so that, looking into a child's eyes, is such an important thing. It activates their vagus nerve. But more than that, looking into a child's eyes is such an important way to connect with the child. But more than that, looking into a child's eyes communicates with a child. A child can read your eyes long before the, a child was capable of verbal communication, the child read your eyes. That was their main way of communicating. And by looking into your eyes, they read your soul. They read how you felt about them. They read whether you accepted them, whether you judged them, whether you had compassion and empathy for them, whether you loved them. They read all of that. They read whether you were at peace in yourself, whether you were regulated and satisfied within yourself. They read that within their, your eyes, and then based on that, they formed their sense of identity because what you felt towards them, they figured was the truth. So by looking in your eyes, they saw what you felt towards them, and then they concluded that's who they were. So... Look into your child's eyes, but make sure that there's not judgment in your eyes. Make sure that you accept them and love them totally, unconditionally. Because as they look into your eyes, that is going to help them to feel safe, loved. It's going to meet a whole bunch of needs, and it is going to help them heal. The next one. If you lose it, apologize right away. There is so much value in the, a child knowing that you have humility. That if you are wrong, you will own it. When you always have to be right. Even though you are wrong, you act like you're right and you blame somebody else. You deflect what will happen if you do that with a child is they will eventually realize that you are not humble, you are not 
wanting to grow. You are not owning your stuff. You are not seeing stuff accurately and they will lose respect for you. Or when they are really young, they will believe you and that will add to their shame load. But more than that, they will twist their minds to agree with your distortion. You will gaslight them and that will have serious long-term effects. But if, if you fail, you humbly admit it and own it and change, your child won't think less of you, they'll think more of you. Humility does not, in a healthy relationship, does not result in humiliation. It results in growing respect. Next one, validate and normalize all your child's emotions. Your child's going to come with an emotional package, an emotional makeup. They could be very expressive. They could have lots of very intense emotions that they want to express and talk about. If you don't accept their emotional makeup, the message they're getting is something's wrong with them. You do not accept them. And that sends powerful rejection messages which result in shame. What you want to do is accept your child, but accept that all emotions have value. And so you want your child to begin to understand the purpose of emotions. So if they have anger, help them understand what, what anger's purpose is. If they're sad, help them understand what the purpose of sadness is. It shows us what's going on underneath so we can deal with it. Don't shut those emotions down just because they make you uncomfortable. And don't try to make them wrong. Help them understand that, the emotion and its purpose, so that when they experience it, they can learn to ask themselves, I wonder what's going on underneath this, and then teach them how to express emotions in a healthy way. That is so important for developing healthy children and helping children heal. What sadly many parents from complex trauma do is they find that their child's emotions trigger them. And a result of that trigger is instead of saying, okay, this is my stuff, they try to shut the child down. So let me make a distinction for you. Your child triggered your response. They didn't cause your response. Your response, the cause, was from years ago, from a wound in your past, probably your childhood, that you have not dealt with, that has not healed. That's the cause of your response today, not your child. Your child just triggered that response today. So make sure you understand that and hopefully you use that to motivate yourself to say, okay, I got some work I need to do on myself. Next, highlight the positive. The focus of complex trauma is negative, avoiding getting hurt. And so we focus on negative. We become critical. We point out flaws all the time. But what we saw at the beginning of this series is that a child, in order for their limbic brain to develop, they need an environment that is very positive. They need way more encouragement and validation than they do having stuff that is negative pointed out to them. And so begin to work at pointing out and validating positive qualities in your children, saying encouraging words, saying validating words. That will be so important in helping them begin to heal and develop a positive space for their limbic brain to heal. The next one is so important. Stop, look, and go. And what that means is before moving on, to your next job. So you've just finished something. Before moving on, stop, look around you, and then go. 
So the purpose of the stop and looking around you is training yourself to be present to what I'm, where I'm at, what's going on, what's happening around me. Be attuned to the people around you. Because what happens with most of us is we stop something, we're in production mode, I got to do the next job on my list, and I move on to the future without totally being in the present. And so, mindful parents make better parents. Such an important statement. So here's some deeper stuff with that. What you're doing is training yourself not to value productivity over relationships, but to value relationships over productivity. So when you finish being productive, doing something, you stop. And before going on to being productive in something else, you go, well, how are my relationships doing? But more than that, what you're doing is you are training yourself to be present to yourself. How am I doing? I can't connect with others unless I connect with myself. So let's stop and ask, where am I at right now? What's going on with me? And then, how is everybody else in my life doing? So I'm present to myself, I'm present to others. Now that's probably easier said than done. Because there's a third thing that's happening underneath. As you stop, look around before you go on, that is, if your old sense of value came from what you do, not who you are, if it came from productivity, not connection, then part of you wants to go on to be more productive because that's where your value comes from. And that's how you've been trying to solve your shame. So before moving on, what you're really doing is retraining yourself that my value is inherent, not be, it's not based on what I do. And what adds to that value is connection and relationships more than productivity. So such an important skill to train yourself to do. The next one, give a name to difficult emotions. Daniel Lieberman has said, when you name your emotions, you help the brain to react less. Name it to tame it, Dan Siegel said. Research has said that when you help a child to verbalize their feelings, even painful or hard ones, it has a neurobiological positive effect immediately. So if a child is struggling and they're getting frustrated and you help them say you're frustrated or you're feeling rejected or you're feeling disrespected, there's something in being able to put a name on that that helps them right away. Now let me take that a little bit further. When a child is in a painful emotion that they can't identify, there's actually two painful things happening. Number one, they're in the painful emotion, but number two, they're in the unknown. They don't know what's going on here. They can't identify it. And so that adds a lot of stress and extra pain to the existing pain of the emotion. And so when you are able to put a name to that emotion, you take them out of the unknown part. They now can understand, oh, this is what is going on. And it reduces the stress in their system right away. And that is such an important thing to understand. So help your children put names to their emotions, to identify their emotions. That's going to help them cope. And do that with yourself as well. Next one. The incredible power of the 20-second hug. What they have found, again, through research, is it releases oxytocin, 
which then helps regulate the nervous system. It helps the child feel connected, and that helps regulate the nervous system. It communicates love. It communicates acceptance. It communicates support. And so there are so many benefits that come out of an extended hug. Now the problem is that for many children with complex trauma, they've already got to a point where they don't want hugs. They don't see you as a safe person yet. They're resistant to a hug. They've developed a big bubble. And so you may not be able to go to a hug right away and don't try to force them to do that. Meet them where they're comfortable. So that might be playing a game. That might be going for a walk. That might be watching a movie together. But doing stuff together where you can connect to it as much as they're capable of. Now you might end up talking. You might not talk. It might be just silence. That's okay too. You're meeting them where they are and looking for ways to connect. Hopefully, in time, they will be able to receive a hug and the love and support that comes from that, but they will only be able to receive it if they are convinced and sense that you are safe and there's no hidden agenda. Next one, make what is happening a safe and open conversation. So let's say that they've just had a conflict with mom. And mom's kind of lost it and become dysregulated and a bit irrational and lashed out at the kid and tried to blame the kid. And the kid is frustrated. The kid is hurting. But something in the kid knows that it's not my fault. Something's going on here with mom. Your child needs to be able to talk about that. Your child doesn't need to hear, respect your mom. You should be obeying your mom. That confuses the child more because they know something's not right here. So make your relationship with your child a safe place to talk about it and make the goal in talking about it to accurately see what is going on. Now this is where some are going to get resistant because what you've been trained is you respect and obey your mom even if she's wrong. And what I want you to hear is you can respectfully challenge your mom. To respect your mom doesn't mean you agree with your mom even when she's wrong. It doesn't mean you do what she says even though it's not the right advice. It means you disagree with respect. And so if you're able to say, okay, mom's having a hard time here. Mom's overreacting. You're seeing that correctly. I support you in feeling frustrated. I support you in respectfully disagreeing with mom. Hopefully in time we can have a conversation and resolve this in a healthy way. That helps the child so much. Somebody is painting an accurate picture, the picture that they've been seeing, but that the authority has been trying to distort, and somebody is supporting them with healthy tools with that picture. Such an important thing. Next one, reframe stories of intergenerational trauma. So let's go again to your child is struggling. Maybe they've been doing a bit of cutting or overeating. Maybe they just find themselves depressed, lots of anxiety, and they in their mind think it's their problem and it's all their problem and it's all their fault. Something is wrong with them. If you are able to come in and paint a bigger picture for them and say, you know what? Your grandma really struggled with depression and anxiety. And that was because she grew up with an alcoholic father. And she passed that on to me. And I struggle with 
depression and anxiety too. And that's been passed on to you because I haven't always been safe because of that. I haven't always been there for you. I haven't always connected with you. All of a sudden, the child realizes, oh, it's not all me. This is what our family's been dealing with. I read of a lady who had all kinds of issues with her dad. And, and made, she just felt it was all her fault. And then she found out that her mother had committed suicide when her dad was a boy. And all of a sudden she realized, oh, so that's why dad became an alcoholic. That's why dad was never there for me. He's never dealt with the suicide of his mom. And all of a sudden, this person said, it has helped me to understand that this didn't begin with me, but in understanding this, it has made me more determined that this intergenerational legacy will end with me. So put your child's complex trauma in a picture of the bigger family and the generational trauma. The next one is a child needs a reliable adult or mentor. Donna Nakazawa said, we know from the research that the presence of one loving adult makes a profound difference. And I would agree. The child will still have some issues to deal with if there's not that second adult present in their life. But one adult who is present, who is growing to become more and more healthy, will make a profound difference. Somebody is, again, through the research has said this, reliable adults is one of the most important factors in determining a child's resilience. And then, finally, teach your child mindfulness. And that, two things. Teach your child to be self-aware of how they're doing emotionally, physically, spiritually. Get them to the beginning of the day, the end of the day. How are you doing? What's going on inside you? Teach them that kind of mindfulness. And then secondly, when your child is feeling sad or anxious or angry, teach them curiosity. Don't just go to condemnation or judgment or say, what's wrong with you for being that way teach them to go hmm, what's going on inside here underneath that so that they can begin to be curious and understand what is happening inside of them so i hope those 14 things are helpful for you now let me go on to a second thing and that is understanding the difference between limbic brain parenting and cortex brain parenting so cortex brain parenting is parenting your child out of your cortex. And your cortex is the part of your brain that thinks through what is healthy long term. What is the right thing to do boundaries wise, how I treat my child that is, is actually truly healthy and loving and will impact them in positive ways long term. What would be an unhealthy thing? So it thinks it through. And then it carries those things out. And it doesn't matter what it's feeling emotionally. It doesn't depend on whether it's feeling motivated or unmotivated today. In a good mood or a bad mood. It acts out of the cortex. So what it says is, I love my children. I'm committed to treat them the way I want to be treated. To connect with them. To be present to them. To get to know them to set and enforce healthy boundaries, to keep growing myself and dealing with my stuff so that I can be a positive role model. That's the cortex. Now the limbic. Well, the limbic is, I act based on how I'm feeling. And so some days my heart just overflows with love for my children. I, I just am willing to do anything, make any sacrifice for them. But there's other days where my children... I'm not loving them at all right now. I'm struggling. In fact, they're really making me annoyed. Or I got so much pain going on in my life, my children are just a burden to me, an annoyance to me. So what happens is if 
we follow our limbic brain. Some days we're good parents. Some days we're terrible parents. Because we're acting out of how I'm feeling. We're letting our feelings determine what we say or do. So what I hope you understand is this. When we act out of our limbic brain, that's when we damage our children. That's when the hurt is done. And so we need to be healing our limbic brain, getting a healthier limbic brain. But our cortex is the base of healthy parenting. Thinking through, this is what I'm going to do every day regardless of whether I'm feeling like it or not. Because it's right. Because it's what love does for a person. There's a third perspective I want you to see. And it's really understanding the behaviorist model of parenting that was very common 50 years ago. So 50 years ago, the priority in parenting was to have good children means you have obedient children. They do what they're told. The focus wasn't on what's going on in my child's life. I need to understand them. I need to get them. There wasn't asking, why does my child do what they do? The whole focus was on do this and not this. And if you do what is wrong, then I'm going to discipline you so you go back to obeying me. So it was all about external behavior, not about understanding the internal world of a child. Now, I think they got a lot of things wrong with that. And for many people, that resulted in complex trauma. Because what the child heard is, nobody gets me, nobody understands me, nobody cares about what I feel, what I think, what's happening inside of me. All I have to do is conform to these behaviors. And if I don't, then I get punished. And so love is conditional. So I don't feel unconditionally loved. I don't feel that I really matter and nobody cares enough about me to get to know me. All that matters is I conform to what they want even if it might not be healthy. And so what came out of that was this upside down approach. So some people said ODD. I'm not going to do what you want because you don't care about me. I'm rebelling. Others went to shame. I don't really matter to you. I will conform. I will play your roles, but I have deep shame happening. But what is a healthy approach? It's to flip it. It's to say, let's not start with just the emphasis on behavior, Let's start with the emphasis on getting to know the child, connecting to the child, being present to the child, understanding the child, listening to the child, not focusing on what you're doing is wrong, but focus on why are you doing that? I want to understand you. If we started there, then the child would feel loved unconditionally and the behavior would just flow out of that. They would want to please us. They would want to do what is healthy. And so the behavior is the emphasis on external behaviors as the priority without emphasis on the internal has led to lots of complex trauma. Finally, I believe it's in Chicago, and I can't remember, and I apologize for that. But there's been a ton of research done on the things that have helped wounded children, the things that have helped them get healthy again. So there's 40 different things, and I want to just quickly go through this list for you. So the first are a series of external assets that help a child who is wounded to get healthy and thrive. So they look at supports. Do they have family support? 
Is there positive communication within the family? Do they have other positive adult relationships? Do they have a caring neighborhood, other people around them that care for them? Is their school environment a caring environment? Are their parents involved in their schooling so they know their parents care for them too? Then, empowerment. So, does their community that they're part of value young people and what young people can offer? Does their community see young people as a resource that can be used to make a better community? Do, does their community involve young people in serving others so that the young people are learning to serve? And <clears throat> do they feel safe within that community? And then an ex another external is boundaries and expectations. Does their family have healthy boundaries? Does their school have healthy boundaries, their neighborhood? Do they have healthy adult role models that they can follow? Do they have positive peer influence, positive peer pressure? Does their society, their neighborhood, their school have good, high, healthy expectations that they achieve, that they make something of their life, that they live a moral, healthy way? Those expectations are so important. And then the, the last external thing is constructive use of time. So are there creative activities that they can be part of? Are there programs that they can become involved in? If they have a religious community, that adds an extra helping thing to them. And do they enjoy time at home where they can interact with siblings and parents in healthy ways? So those are all things that help a child thrive. They're all the external pieces. Now let's go to the internal. What you want to develop within the child is... A, motiv a, a motivation where the child wants to ch achieve. The child wants to make a difference. And then the child wants to get involved in school. The child wants to do homework. The child connects to people, wants to connect and make good, healthy friends. The child enjoys reading. And they want to keep learning. Those are internal attitudes you want to foster within the child. Then you want them to have positive values. Where they develop a care for others, for animals. They value equality. They value social justice. They are marked by an integrity. Where they live by a moral code that is healthy. That they are the same at home in public. There's integrity. There's oneness. They're honest. They're responsible. They learn to control their impulses and restrain themselves. They have good self-discipline. Those you want to foster within them. And then competencies. You want them to grow, to learn how to think and become good decision makers and to plan their life and their days. You want them to develop social skills so they can learn how to communicate in social environments, so interpersonal competence. You want them to cultural competence, to be aware of functioning within a culture in a healthy way. You want them to have the ability to say no to peer pressure, to what is unhealthy, and then to negotiate a better solution. And then you want them to develop skills to resolve conflict. Such important tools for a child. And then finally, their identity. Their core identity needs to be positive. So you need to heal shame. 
so that they have a sense of personal power, that they aren't helpless, that they can make a difference, that they can make choices, that they like themselves, they accept themselves, they have a sense of purpose in life, and they have a positive view about their future. So those are four different things that have come up about parenting children who come out, come out of complex trauma. Children who aren't a clean slate. Children who already have unhealthy tools who are wounded. I hope that helps. Well, that's the end of part one. We're going to take a short break. Come back for the Christian part. If that doesn't interest you, not a problem. You're free to go. We'll see you next week. Everybody else will be back in just a minute. Well, welcome back. I want to start a new series in the Christian part on the book of Psalms, which is in the very middle of the Bible. And it is the, was the Jewish book of poems or songs or prayers. And why I want to do this is really kind of two main things. I want people to get an insight into what does healthy prayer look like? But secondly, what does the internal world of a spiritual person look like? And why I want to do that is because I think both of those have been distorted in many religions today and in many types of spirituality. Because when you think of what does healthy prayer look like and what does the internal world of a healthy pers spiritual person look like, Many of a person, people would think, oh, they never get angry. They're always calm. They're always feeling loving. They always have pure motives. Like they just go to this idyllic type of thinking. And, and so I want you to actually understand the internal working of truly spiritual people, what it looks like and what their prayer life looked like. What the, is interesting to me is when you look at the book of Psalms, which is the Jewish prayer book, and it's got 150 different prayers in it, the majority of the prayers start out full of negative stuff, pain. That is significant. Because for so what the Jewish people are re saying is, Prayer isn't just, dear God, you're wonderful, thank you, thank you. Prayer is pain, groaning. And so the prayer book is educating people that the main prayer language we need to learn and understand is the groaning prayer. That's the common issue that spiritual people put into words in their relationship with God. So the majority of the 150 prayers are what are known as lament psalms, groaning psalms, cries of anguish, cries of anger and rage. So they're psalms that are lament, sadness, complaints, expressions of pain, and anger. I just love that. I, I, that's to me so fascinating. And so as you read these prayers, what you find is they start with these people focused totally on themselves, on their pain, on their circumstances, on their needs. And you, you find these prayers are not polite. They accuse God of not caring. They accuse God of being unjust. They accuse God of abandoning them, of falling asleep on the job. Like they're saying stuff about God in those prayers out of pain, out of anger. And also in those prayers, they're wanting terrible things to happen 
to their enemies. They're wanting their enemies to be wiped off the face of the earth. Like they're lashing out. And sometimes they just want God to go away, to leave them alone, so they can just sit in their anger and pain. And then in some of the prayers, you find them trying to manipulate God to give them what they want. So these prayers, as you read them, you go, whoa, this must be a very unspiritual person to be saying these kind of things. Uh Uh-uh. This is a very spiritual person. This is the realistic life of a person who's spiritual. That's what I want you to understand as we go through this short study on the Psalms. So let me just take it a little bit further. The word psalm actually in the Hebrew language means praise. So what is again interesting is the majority of the Psalms start out with complaint, not praise. They start out with anger. They start out with pain. They start out with lashing out. They don't start out with praise. Take it further. What I find sad is that many religions today, if they read a psalm in one of their church services, they read the psalms that are pure praise. They ignore these songs that start out with some of this negative stuff. And so they give kind of a misrepresentation of what prayer looks like as being just this pure praise. But what the Psalms teach us is in all of these Psalms that start out with complaints, there's movement, except for two. There's two where we're not going to see movement, and we'll look at them later. But the point is this the Psalms of relationship with God, the spiritual life, It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be sad. It's okay to be anxious. It's okay to express that to God. It's okay okay to lash out at God. God can handle that. But it doesn't stay there. The reason you're expressing all of that is to process it so that you move to a place where you trust God, where you surrender to God. So what happens in these psalms, which is so beautiful, is they start out in places of pain. They're honest about their pain. They express all of the confusion and anger and emotions around that pain. God never judges them for that. God's okay. That's a real relationship with God. But then it moves to a place of being able to trust God and surrender. So what I want you to understand is this. The movement that happened happens internally. Their external circumstances don't change. They're still just as crappy. But they now have a movement internally where they go, I hate my circumstances. I, I hate God that you've allowed me to have this. Why aren't you doing something? They've moved to, okay, God, I trust you in these circumstances even though they never change and a peace comes in, a joy comes in. That is what is happening in the Psalms. So let me put it in complex trauma language. These prayers start out in the limbic brain. The emotions, the anger, the depression, the anxiety, all of those things are happening and they are expressing that. And do you realize God is okay with limbic brain prayers? But the goal is not that they stay in the limbic brain. The goal in prayer is to help people move from the limbic brain into their cortex and to be able to come to a place where they trust the facts about God, not the emotions they feel because of their circumstances. So there's a movement from the limbic brain into the cortex. All part of spirituality. All part of God's okay with it. But events trigger the childlike limbic brain, the emotions, and that's where they start out, and that's the real part of their relationship with God, includes that. 
But it moves to a place of surrender, of trust, of being in the cortex, of hanging on to God's promises. So let me give you one of the lament psalms, Psalm 6. So it says, For the choir director, a psalm of David, to be accompanied by an eight-string instrument. Now let me just give you a little footnote here that you might find interesting. That term for the choir director, what researchers, scholars are finding is that in the very early centuries of the church, that term was often used to refer to the end one, to the end one is the, is the idea, but to the Messiah, to, the, to Jesus. And so basically any psalm that has that was taken to be a psalm that pointed to Jesus to tell us something about what Jesus would be like or something Jesus would say or do. And so what you're going to see in this psalm is that Jesus, this was an expression of his heart at some point. And that's going to blow you away possibly. But I want this you to see that this is the expression of every spiritual person's heart at some time in their life, even Jesus. So it says, O Lord, don't rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your rage. So they're in their mind, God's angry at me, which isn't true, but that's where their limbic brain has taken them. Have compassion on me, Lord, for I am weak. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. I am sick at heart. How long, O oh Lord, until you restore me? So this person is struggling. This person is in pain. And it could be physical and emotional pain. And their circumstances are all bad. And it, it makes them feel like God's upset with them. Return, O oh Lord, rescue me, save me because of your unfailing love. So now they're starting to move to the cortex. It might seem like you're angry, but I know you have unfailing love. For the dead do not remember you. Who can praise you from the grave? I am worn out from sobbing. All night I flood my bed with weeping, drenching it with my tears. In other words, I wake up in the morning and my mattress is soaked. From my tears I cry so much. My vision is blurred by my grief. My eyes are worn out because of all my enemies. I can't... I have puffy eyes. I can't even see clearly because I've been crying so much. Go away, all you who do evil, for the Lord has heard my weeping. The Lord has heard my plea. The Lord will answer me. Hasn't answered me yet, but I know he will. May all my enemies be disgraced and terrified. May they suddenly turn back in shame. That's I lament psalm. That's the prayer of a hurting heart. That's the prayer of a person who's got enemies and circumstances all causing them pain. And they're wrestling with God. And what do I understand is that's okay. That's a real relationship. But you can see the movement begin to happen where they're going to trust that God is an unfailing love and they'll hang on to his promises. So, Understand the assumptions that are operating as the person is venting their pain and frustration with their circumstances and with God. Underneath that, two assumptions. God cares about my pain. Secondly, God can help me. That's why I'm praying, because he cares and he can help. So, you get to the end, the circumstances haven't changed. There hasn't been a movement there, but there's been a movement internally. And so really what I'm hoping is this series will give you permission to have a real relationship with God, to understand what it looks like, to develop that spiritual part of your life in a healthy way. Let's pray. Father, I just am so thankful that these books, this book of prayers is in the Bible. It has been such 
a help to me in the painful times of my life to read the honest expressions of pain to you that others have given, to know that it's okay to have a real relationship with you, that that's what you want. And I just pray that you would help each person as they learn that themselves in their own life. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here. Hope this